actually feel like we we have buzzword cycles and I always tell everyone this. So we go through buzzword cycles, but the best time to be building in a space is not during the buzzword cycle. Mm. It's the before and the after. Hello there, welcome to Mutual Knowledge. I am Gautier Lamote, your host, and today my guest is Tracy. How do I, do I pronounce your name? Is it Levine or Levin? I, I never know. Levine. 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 Okay, so yeah. depending on where we come from. All right. Hi, Tracy. Yeah. Nice to have you here. Nice to be here. I'm super excited to talk and chat all things today. So, Tracy, you're the CEO and founder of Make It MVP, and you have so many other businesses. I think we won't be able to cover that in uh, only one interview. What would you like to say about yourself to introduce you to uh, our viewers? Yeah, so CEO and founder of Make It MVP. I also work as a technical product manager um, at a startup called Think of Us. And in the past, um, I was on the research and development team in Web3 at Niantic, so definitely have a really cool past and experiences and love helping people break into tech, learn about new tech tools and technologies and mentoring startup founders as well. Has most of your career been spent in, uh, in entrepreneurship or have you done other jobs as well? No, my background is actually in education and social work. Mm -hmm. um, I went to school for Jewish education, did, got a master's in social work, worked as a teacher and a nonprofit manager for many, many years and decided I wanted a change. And when I made that change, I went to a tech boot camp, became a software engineer and the rest is kind of history from there. I know that's quite a stretch. I love it. And so what was the, uh, the thing that made you rush for the, the first company you created? The first business um, or the first project you managed as the as the head of the project, I mean. Yeah, I would say the first company I created was Make It MVP, and it's still like my baby project. Um, and the reason that I created it is when I graduated boot camp, one of the biggest challenges that I saw um, was I actually was lucky and got job interviews like from our pitch night, but most of my friends did not. And they were like, their mental health was going down because they were getting rejection after rejection after rejection. And I was like, how can I boost their um, resumes to help them get hired faster? And that was kind of how we started making MVP. And in that first year, we did eight MVPs for eight different founders and had about 150 tech bootcamp grads on projects. Um, so it was a super cool experience and that was why i created my first endeavor <laughs> all right and so what's the advice you would give other people struggling in this business or in uh, in this area of this part of the job um what's the the advice you would give to keep their mental health quite sane because that's a yeah. tough job to w when you yeah i would say in the job search the biggest challenge is to find opportunities to practice your skill um, especially in tech, like the more you have on your portfolio, the more likely you're going to get hired. If you can put that you were an apprentice, apprentice or an intern somewhere, people are going to hire you faster than if you say, I graduated from a tech boot camp, but I have no experience. Um, that's advice number one. And then number two advice that I always give everyone is get rid of the word junior. You're not a junior. <laughs> Just always own your role like yeah you may be applying for junior and 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 entry level jobs but like you're not a junior don't put your sell yourself short you've put in the effort you've put in the work you're applying to entry level jobs yes and you're but like yeah. but like own it like you're now a software engineer you're now a ux designer you're now a product manager you put in the work own that title and like don't sell yourself short all right. And what about uh, company building, such as fundraisings or things like that? Is it some, th something you're familiar with or that you've gotten um, familiar so yeah. with? Yeah, I've definitely gotten familiar with it. Um, I have had like one exit already, so I definitely have gotten familiar with it. Um, one thing that I actually just wrote a Medium article on yesterday is that when you're at your idea stage, one of the biggest things that I see founders fail especially non-technical founders, is that they think that their first hire needs to be a CTO. And that's not always the case. 
a lot of times your first hire should be a product manager or someone who understands product strategy, a growth marketer, a product manager, someone who really understands product strategy and can document out exactly what the product roadmap should be for you in technical terms. Um, and then you can pass that off to a team of developers and designers, whether that be an overseas team, an internal team, whatever it is, a studio, you need someone that can talk the talk to help you to get your thoughts out. And so I think that the first hire should always be someone who has a product background and not necessarily the best developer or the best, most elite technologist. Well, that's, um, okay. Good yeah, advice for young startups then. Yeah, that's like my insight for startup owners. And then my insight, when I say like I exited, like I had a unique exit, so it was not like the typical, but what I will say about the experience is you may put in all this effort to get things done, but the reality of the situation is if they're interested, they're interested and it doesn't matter how shitty or how good your documentation is, they're interested because they think your idea is good. So, and there's potential. So just sell it with your words, sell it with your enthusiasm, sell it with your team. Um, and that's what worked for me at least. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, primarily focus on uh, on how you're going to monetize it and solve other people's problems with it and not on how you're going to, uh, to do it from a technical standpoint and... Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. All right. And so um, you, you were talking about tech and uh, educating people in, uh, in this super wide spectrum. Uh, what are the techs that sound promising and game changing, world changing in the, in the next decade for you? You can say, so of I course, say Web3 and AI and, and so on. But what, <laughs> no, what I, I would actually, like to know is why. <laughs> I actually feel like we, we have buzzword cycles. And I always tell everyone this. So we go through buzzword cycles, but the best time to be building in a space is not during the buzzword cycle. Mm. It's the before and the after. So I'm going to give the example of AR VR, right? Mm -hmm. AR VR was like a really big thing, like five, seven years ago. Like the first Oculus glasses came out and everyone was super excited about these VR worlds and like this, you know, and then it kind of like, people were like, oh, I don't really want to wear this headset. It makes me nauseous. It's this, it's that, right? It kind of took a lull. But then people like Niantic and people like Unity and people like all these other AR companies, Snap, um, Meta, you know, they've been continuously, Apple, they've been continuously building it in it. And you're going to see, in my opinion, you're going to see a wave of AR coming out in the next few years that's going to, legitimately change the way that we see things at um, in the world. And I think the same thing with Web3. So I did not buy into the hype cycle actually, but I ended up selling a Web3 company um, or getting Aqua hired mm -hmm. as a Web3 company. And I honestly didn't buy into it because I was like, okay, like this is a hype cycle. Like, I don't buy into hype cycles same way I'm not buying into the AI hype cycle, even though I do use ChatGPT on a daily basis, right? Um, but like, I just didn't buy into it. It wasn't like my go-to whatever. And then I spent a year and a half, honestly, working at Niantic in research and development and Web3 during the height of it and realized the technology just like wasn't there for the mainstream world yet. It has a place, it has a space decentralization is the future and we're going to get there and it's going to happen and it's going to make such a difference in the world. But the technology and the cost effectiveness of the technology right now for someone mainstream, like a Niantic or like any of these mainstream companies, it's just not Nickelodeons, the Nickelodeons of the world, the, the Niantics of the world, the Disney's of the world it's just not there yet. It's too expensive. It's too, the UI is not there yet, but I truly believe that the people that are building in the web three space still, they're going to be the ones that are going to come out in like two, three years and be like, and have made the game changer mm. and have made, made it mainstream. So, so if I get you right, that means that the, the people who built something with AI 
in the uh, before the buzzwords are those that uh, who are functional when the buzzword cycle starts so exactly yeah okay so because they started being functional before the hype now they are they are getting profitable and it's a bit late for those who are just discovering it because they also have to figure out what's the hype and what's real same thing for web3 yeah. okay and same thing for vr of course wonderful all yeah. right and what, what do you I'm, think that's my hot take. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I can like it. I find that inspiring because it's usually if people want to make a lot of money with a new tech, it's very likely that most people uh, that there are experts on the field already. If, if you just learned about it and learned about how profitable it is, of course. And so this leads me to another question. Um, You were talking about AI, chat GPT on a daily basis. I'm always curious about entrepreneurs and how they use it. Is it secret? Is it, is it um, bad for your reputation? Or is it okay for you to tell us how you use that on a daily basis? Honestly, <laughs> I don't think it's a secret how I use it. I'm a terrible writer. Wonderful. Like terrible, terrible writer. So, and I just don't enjoy writing. It's not my like favorite thing to do. Um, and so... All of my newsletters for work for my company, I've created good prompts and I've created a voice and a brand voice and all of that in a chat GPT thread. And so I can just like push out what I need every week. Um, and it's already trained in like who our company is and what our company does and what do we need to be including in this. Um, and then in my PM life, in my product manager role, I actually honestly use it for everything. I write, I have conversations, like as if ChatGPT is the other PM in the room, I have conversations back and forth with ChatGPT and I come up with our product strategy while using it to come up with the right documentation. Now, obviously I have to be able to feed it the right prompts and I have to be able to like train it the way that I need to train it. And a lot of times I have to edit things out or take things out because they missed the mark, right? I don't think... ChatGPT is 100% accurate. I actually would say it's actually getting dumber, in my personal opinion. Many um, people reported that, yes. Yeah, I would say that over the last few weeks, it's actually gotten dumber. Um, but I use it. It's like my it's like my coworker that like is sitting next to me at home and helps me with everything. And regarding the fact that it got dumber, uh, is it uh, do, do do you know why is, uh, why that is, or do you have guesses? Um, I think that, um, I have a few guesses. One, I think that it, when something becomes so mainstream, it's being trained on so much garbage that it's just not maintaining its levels. And I also think it may have taken off too fast. I think, um, kind of reminds me of like the, uh, the NFT boom of mm -hmm. the end of 2021, beginning of 2022, or 2023, 2022, 2023, whatever it was, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where like all of a sudden all this like garbage started coming up at, and all the scams and all the, you know, <laughs> the garbage of, of Web3 started coming out and you're just like, Mm, what's going on here and how do I know what's good and what's bad and I feel like ChatGPT like the model they can't keep up with the amount of users and the amount of data that's coming into it right now mm. so they, they, they like the people to tell the the network yes that is a valid answer or no that's a, that's a clumsy answer mm -hmm. and so on okay got it and so You were talking about Web3 a bit earlier, and so you said, okay, this is probably coming. So let's not talk about NFTs because that's a very painful subject for the viewers who, <laughs> who blindly invest. I, I think NFTs are useful uh, to, uh, to some extent in some very technical cases, but since most people who use main, uh, mainstream I NFTs, think NFTs will come back in a very different way. Yeah, after the buzzwords. Yeah, I um, think they'll come back. I just don't think it's going to be an art, and I don't think it's going to be in... Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, yeah. I think we agree on this matter. I, to, I totally think there, there will be many applications, just probably not uh, telling you in telling you that you own a JPEG file that anyone can uh, can scan or anything. But uh, you were talking about Web3. So aside from uh, those 
funny NFTs. Um, what do you think? Uh, we were talking about payments. We can talk about uh, the applications in healthcare and uh, in counterfeit product management. Uh, so you said the tech is not mainstream at the moment. What should become? Uh, what should we change in this tech to make it more mainstream, both uh, yeah. either in the B 2 B or B 2 C sector? Yeah, I would say one is UI in general. Like there's just because we have to sign every transaction and there's just so many steps. It's like extra steps in UI. And oh it's gosh, just like, yes. It's so painful. Um, that would be um, the first one mm -hmm. that I would say needs to do an overhaul and needs to really, we got to fix that. Um, speed. I don't think that the speed has been there in my experience. Um, I know we were building a game when I was at Niantic and we would literally have to manually refresh the NFTs because the speed was just so slow and it wasn't hmm. keeping up the game that we were up to. Um, and it was just like so frustrating across the board. Um, so I think the speed is definitely gonna have to and then obviously cost. Like every transaction just costs so much right now. And even if you're on a polygon or a low, lower co you know, coin, not the mainstream Ethereum, like it, the cost is just so high comparative to a GCP or an, a or a AWS, you know, transaction, like the cost is like quadruple or more. And so I think that if it's going to become mainstream, it has to, the cost has to go down somehow. So the gas prices have to, to get I don't lower. know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to, to, lower. to reduce drastically. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and then I think the use cases that I can see, though, like I have been saying this from day one, I really can see my health records being on the blockchain. And how nice would that be? Because the most frustrating thing is when I go to a new doctor and I have to fill out all that paperwork again, and then I have to go to my old doctor and have all my files transferred because this one uses this system and this one uses this system and this one uses this system. And I have to like move everything around and there's so many moving pieces and they don't talk to each other. Like how nice would it be if it was all on Polygon, for example, or on Ethereum, for example? And uh, everyone is using that. It's an EVM compatible chain. And everyone is using that. And everyone is pushing my medical record up there to the same node. And then, oh my gosh, like every doctor can pull it and see it and update it. I believe you're a, you're a U.S. resident and citizen, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so for, for me, There's it's a lot of legalities in that one. No, no. But, but I mean, uh, um, because I'm a French citizen. Um, in France, we we have had a uh, centralized a centralized system, but with every doctor using it on a public record for uh, for decades. So th we don't have that problem. If you just uh, go to another doctor, he he or she is going to have your your data. But our main problem is the safety because it's very very common. Uh, for these institutions to lose, the, to let data loose, and oh, too bad somebody knows that you have diabetes or a weak knee or whatever, and yeah, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, we 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 see a, another interest in uh, having the blockchain, not the accessibility, but the the privacy because it's a less hackable system than something done by an underpaid government technician. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly. uh, that's the difference. Okay, so these are the things you uh, you think about in terms of payments. Uh, I believe you you were already fam familiar with um, uh, with our Web three enabler app a little bit. So yeah. in terms of payments, uh, how do you think this market is going to evolve? Honestly, the biggest example that I can sh tell you is the whole war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, there were many Ukrainians that were stuck in the country and couldn't get out and their bank accounts were frozen, but mm -hmm. they were able to get out because they were able to transact in crypto. Mm -hmm. And the way that Web3 and Web3 Enabler and all of these, you know, tools to transact in crypto are going to make a difference in the world is the sense of easy transactions globally. The fear that I see though, like I'm going to give the negative as well. Um, the fear that I see is that you don't necessarily know where your money is going to. Mm. And so you can't confirm 
it and if there's like a uh mess up get yeah, it back you, you can't sue once so you, you, you don't have gone. a third party to sue yeah once you once it's gone it's gone and that's that's the fear that's out there right now so um I think it's going to make a difference in the world. I think that it can really help solve issues of poverty and 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 different things and make transactions better. I I, I do. Um, do I feel like the world is ready to accept it yet? I think we're getting there. I don't think we're there yet. I think the hype cycle and then the fraud of SBB, <laughs> I mean SBF, and like all the other fraud that happened last year destroyed that hype for us and yeah we've been hindered for a year or two probably yeah and and put a hinder on us but i think that give it two or three years and you're going to see a big change hmm. wonderful and um you were talking about so um war zones and um and people trying to to get out of the country um and you were talking about ux as uh, also at the beginning of our talk and this reminds me of an anecdote at a convention one of my business partners uh, at moon uh, Fare, saw a person just demonstrating how simple it was to use this new wallet and the guy sent 15k dollars to another address and so he said so you see with this new wallet everything is so smooth the design is just smooth and that person sent 15k he said oh shit it's not the oh damn it's not the proper address well i just lost 15k back back to it and that was very trivial for that person because he was one of the of the people who got lucky by you know <laughs> Buying a thousand dollars worth of e, uh, ETH of ETH uh, when it was very cheap, but still that person had lo so technically that guy had lost a few cents from his first investment, but technically that guy had lost 15k in, uh, in, in yeah. any case. So yeah, you, UX is a really really big problem in this industry. Yeah, and because of the no KYC or like the people don't want to be doxxed and all of that, like you know you don't. You can't confirm or deny who you're sending to. And like, guess what? Many times fraud happens because of that. Well, this happens less and less in the, in the B2B sector, though. And so you were talking about AI yourself. How do you, how do you envision the, the future? Same thing as for Web3. I love, I love what you say for, about Web3. So let's ask you the same question <laughs> regarding AI, because that's fe I feel I'm going to be inspired. Um, yeah, so I think AI, my take on AI right now is that we're in a hype cycle, but we're in a hype cycle that is the second round of the hype cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like we had like this machine learning when like Siri came out and the Alexas and all of these like tools that we don't think of as AI, but really are, um, you know, a few years ago. And then now we're in like, this is where it can fit into the human's hand. And then what's going to happen after this is it's in the human's hand now, right? So it's in the day-to-day -day use. Let's see what they do with it. And then the real use of AI is going to come out and the future of AI. And you know what? AI probably will be in most things. It's going to, it, it will. Like every product I see now has like a new AI feature. Like I opened Zapier today, for example. And you could type into Zapier exactly what you want the triggers to do, and then it'll create the triggers for you without you having to do anything. Yeah. And I was like, like everyone's doing this now. But what is really AI? It's just an automation. Like it's just like a a faster automation system that like is automating your thoughts and your work. Yeah, but it's interesting for 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 low level programmers. It changes in, uh, in it yeah. turns English into a programming language. Yeah. And I just think that it's going to become mainstream. It's something we're all going to be using. So eventually, it's not going to be like, oh, I'm using AI. Like right now, it's, oh, I'm using AI. In the future, like my children and my children's children, it's like, oh, I'm using my computer. Yeah, they won't even know there's AI. They in won't it. even know that there was something that didn't have AI in it because everything is going to have it. And that's okay. We have to just be smart and know that sometimes the models are not 100% accurate and we can't. Right now, the biggest challenge is going to be accuracy. How can we tweak the models to get them more accurate? And how can we maintain privacy when privacy is necessary? Um, and that's going to become a challenge too. 
Um, I mean, I see it as a challenge now, but it's going to become even more of a challenge in the near future as it becomes even more use. And I think there's also going to be an education piece that needs to happen. Such as? Um, people use ChatGPT, like, <laughs> I don't want to call out my boss. I don't want to call out the CEO of the company I'm working at, but I was working with him on something and I was watching how he was communicating with ChatGPT and I was just like, if you would just prompt engineer this a little bit more this way and this way and this way, you'll probably get more accurate results. Um, and so prompt engineering is going to be a big thing. And understanding how to prompt engineer properly is going to be an education piece that if we are allowing AI and ChatGPT in schools and in education, then let's allow it, but let's teach them how to use it properly. Of course. Just like we, we, we had to teach high schoolers 20 years ago how to use Wikipedia. Not 20 years, but yeah. like, uh, 15 years I ago, we had to teach them how to use that. I remember in high school, we had a typing class. Mm -hmm. And we had a teacher, it's probably illegal, honestly. We had a teacher who used to take a ruler. And if you weren't typing fast enough, your hands were covered on the thing. Like you couldn't see your hands and you couldn't see the keyboard and you had to type with accuracy. And if you weren't typing fast enough, she would smack the ruler on the table and sometimes she would miss and hit your hands. Um, okay, old, old school piano <laughs> lessons. Very, exactly, old Very school. 1570s, okay. Yeah, but like we had a typing accuracy class. Like that was something that was the norm when yeah, I was in that, school. That, that's what, uh, well, that, that was something indeed. And, and there, were, uh, there were times when people had internet classes in high school where they they were told how to use google properly and how to check sources so and i still think that we need that i think we need an education piece on how to use google properly <laughs> i don't think everyone knows how to google i always say the best thing that i the the way that i got through my tech boot camp was that i was a really good googler hmm. so <laughs> you know it's it's a it's a joke uh, of people saying oh how did you fix fix that you're really a computer uh, Uh, a really computer spaz. No, I just went uh, went to Google and I just asked the right question. I didn't know before I learned it. Uh, but because we're talking about that and you were talking about fears, for example, regarding uh, Web3, one of the common fears about AI is an ethical fear, notably the fact that pe people get predictable. We know that uh, if you have enough likes, enough, um, a sample big enough from a person, you can make that person very predictable. So some people think, okay, AI is going to be like uh, um, is going to create a future where basically your smartwatch uh, just tells by your heart rate that you're probably going to be willing to buy a diet coke when you go back home. So ChatGPT has already run some a few auctions to buy the the cheapest diet coke and ha has it delivered by drone. Oh, thank you! I didn't even need I didn't even know I needed that before you brought it to my fridge. Th you brought it to my fridge. Thank you, ChatGPT. I love you and love you too. But, but um, Some people fear the day we will have a technology and automated tech and a government that knows people better than they know themselves. What do you think about the, uh, this ethical concern? ChatGPT has zero emotion. That, that, that's it. Like coming from a, I, I actually watched someone who was building a, um, a therapy app Ooh. Where, your, where your bot was your therapist. Your I, I'm quite sensitive to that because I've been trained as a ther therapist and for now what I've seen is pretty Me shitty. Too. Uh, and uh, for now it's it, pretty unsatisfying, I thought. But. Yeah, I played with it a little bit and I spoke to them a lot about it and I was like, I would never, and maybe that's just me, I would never use it. <laughs> uh, I would never trust it, I would never use it and I'm scared that it would tell me to jump off a bridge. Uh, well, you know, it's it's already very hard to uh, to get a teeny tiny politically incorrect uh, joke from ChatGPT. Most of the time, it's going to tell you, "Sorry, I'm not allowed to tell you that." Uh, so I suppose some people will, would would implement guide uh, guide rails. But what I what I found very problematic in this AI uh, in these therapy bo bots is that basically what they say is just bland tasteless and uh yes it's no it, it, it sounds like empathy it looks like it but honestly it's like okay it's slightly better than a person who has not been trained at all but 
it's just when you tell jokes you have to feel your audience it's the same thing as therapy so there are very bad things you can do in therapy and that are, that are very healthy processes for another person so uh, yeah. yeah okay so uh, <laughs> it doesn't have emotion it's not a human we and, have... and do you think it, um, it can work still for some behaviors and that uh, do you think it would pose eth ethical concerns to automate people's lives um I I want to say no, honestly. Oh, interesting. I want to take a hot take and say that, like, there's just, as a trained therapist and as someone who goes to therapy and as someone who is very into the mental wellness space, mm -hmm. there's something about that human interaction that is so integral to our lives that talking to a computer will never be able to do or talking to a robot will never be able to do. Unless that robot looks exactly like me, has the exact same facial expressions, which I think we're many, many years away from, and has has my brain living in it. Honestly, like I know my friends, right? I can have a conversation with one friend and I can have a conversation with another friend. Both friends will come to me with the same issue, but the way I respond to one friend and the way I respond to another friend are gonna be totally different oh, because yeah. I know yeah because I know the inner workings of each of those friends. Of course. <laughs> Even if you respond they... to the same friend at, at a different time of the day. Exactly. Like I know what's going on and you can't train a robot on that. I, I assume. And I, I was thinking more about the fact that uh, that tech could be used to basically buy stuff for you, basically uh, tell you, OK, vote for this citizen according to you, the beliefs. I can suppose that. But yeah, you're yeah. right. It's already I happening. Think, I think it's already happening. I think that's happening on TikTok when it has recommended ads or on Facebook when it has recommended ads. Like they know what we like and what we're buying. Okay, so it just doesn't, um, it, ju it doesn't buy the thing for you, but it's already yeah, I sorting think, them you know, for you in any way. In any Amazon case. does that a lot where it sets up a subscribe and save without you, sometimes without you knowing, or like I could tell Alexa right now I need, Alexa, don't listen. Atara, I call it, I call Alexa Atara when I don't want her to know I'm talking about her. Um, so I could tell Atara that, you know, I need a new dress and Atara is going to order that new dress for me sometimes without me even thinking about it. Right? Well, like, yeah. So th this is already happening and this could happen in, and, uh, yeah. in many parts of our lives. Yeah. And I don't think that there's going to be an accuracy. I, I, I still have the accuracy concern. Like, yeah, my heart rate might be up and maybe, but maybe I don't want that Diet Coke. Maybe I want a good coffee. Maybe I want, and maybe I don't want that Ethiopian coffee. Coffee. I want that Kenyan coffee or that Colombian coffee. How is it going to know all those nuances? That, that, that's the, the tricky question. And that's, uh, that also, po uh, that also, Ask this asks this question from a human being. How how can I take care of the of those I love? I'm probably also going to be inaccurate when I'm taking care of the people I know very well. Yeah. So for you, the ethical concerns are not the the uh, on this side are not the biggest ones. Are there some others or some other fears that you? Uh, and thank you so much by, for this very original uh, original piece of thought, by the way. But are there other ethical concerns you think uh, you think of to to finish this interview regarding AI or any other super hot te tech, by the way? Super hot takes. No, I think that the ethical concern with AI is going to become that no one's going to have their own voice anymore. Hmm think you know we train an ai as much as we can but and then the problem with gen z and i think it's gen a is the next generation below that like thinking about my 18 year old brothers right um they literally use chat gpt to do all their schoolwork they don't have like a voice they don't have like a, a knowledge base anymore they just use chat gpt and say hey write this or another example my cousin got engaged this weekend and my my uncle needed to write a speech for the engagement party and he used ChatGPT. Oh shit. And okay. Like, this is going too far. <laughs> like it's just it's just speak from your heart. Tell us what you feel. Like forget about it. Like stop getting rid of emotions. Emotions are okay. Emotions are okay. Personality is okay. Like 
humans are okay. We were brought into this world for a reason. Like, and our emotions and our personalities are okay. And just accept that. Don't take the emotion out of it. Don't take the feeling out of it. That's that. My hot take is that emotion is okay. <laughs> Wonderful. That, that's my hot take. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Tracy. We had to keep this interview short for schedule reasons, but I I feel almost frustrated because I, I think I'd love to have another interview of you uh, focused on the technical aspects because we, we didn't uh, go into the dive into this so much. So thank you so much. Uh, no. Any last word for the for the viewers? Guys, just keep those emotions in check. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, no, really, like buzzwords are great but be cautious. That would be my my last words of advice. Buzzwords are great, but be cautious. Everyone, this was Mutual Knowledge Podcast. We had Tracy Levine, CEO and founder of Make It MVP, among many other things. Thank you so much, Tracy. No problem. Thank you for having me. <laughs>